if you have too many big, hairy, audacious goals, you'll start to feel overwhelmed. You'll feel like you're being pulled in 100 different directions. I'm a big believer in finding something that you want to excel at. Pick one thing and pull all your heart and energy towards that. What that means is you have to sacrifice other things that you want. The Perspective Podcast is fuel for your mind and creative grind. Each week, my guests and I provide the skills for thinking bigger, overcoming adversity, and making an impact with your work. PC family, I'm chopping it up with Chris Doe of the future today. Chris, welcome to the Perspective Podcast and helping me celebrate episode 150. How are you doing today, man? Woo, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the show and congrats on 150. What a milestone. I know I'm playing catch up to you, but I'm running my own race right now. So <laughs> much thanks. Uh, so before we can just dive into the meat, we got to hit that surface level stuff. So give us a brief Wikipedia page summary about yourself or someone in my audience who's crazy enough not to know the content that you put out and what you're building. Okay, so my name is Chris Doe. I'm the founder of The Future. That's an online education platform and channel. We broadcast on YouTube, on LinkedIn, Instagram, pretty much on all major social platforms. Prior to that, though, I ran a very successful motion design firm based in Los Angeles, California, called Blind. For people who want to look us up and see our work, it's blind.com. That tells you we're OG because we got blind.com. That was something that I started in 1995, produced hundreds of commercials, and then towards the latter part of my career, started to get serious about the education game. I think that's why we're talking today. Yeah, this is that. I feel like you've rehearsed your elevator pitch maybe a couple times. Couple times. Couple times. <laughs> So one question right off the bat, because I have a bone to pick with the traditional school system, and I believe that's what attracted me to what you do in the first place with building the future, because I went to a private school, got a liberal arts degree, tried to play mm. football in college, blew my back out, and accumulated wow. all this private debt, you know, just to play some football. I didn't know what I got myself into, and now I'm, yeah. I'm figuring it out along the way. So I've been self-taught once I graduated, um, but something else I'm really, really big on is casting big visions. And that's what I try to help my coaching program do. Um, and it, pretty much anybody who listens to the podcast to, uh, and then make a plan you know, after they cast that vision. So you state your mission is to impact one billion lives. Yes. And that's bold as hell. Isn't you know, it? That, that, it's, it's awesome, though. And I want to <laughs> get a little bit more deep on the other side of it. But can you expand on that a little bit more for those who may not know what you mean so you can attract them to your tribe? Sure. I believe this. And I, I also do uh, personal coaching. So I, I want people to set a big goal, a big, hairy, audacious goal, a bag, B-H-A-G. And I, I can't tell people to do something if I don't live that myself. So we got together with our team and said, what's a big, hairy, audacious goal that we have? And how will we know we've hit it? So you got to be specific and it has to be measurable. And smart so that's rules. why, yes, smart rules. Yeah. Uh, that, that's why we set up the idea that we want to impact a billion people on planet Earth. There are 7 billion currently. So depending on how fast the world expands, that's one in seven people. We know that that's a lot to go after to say one in seven people will be impacted by what we do. And we're making a dent in the universe. That's the whole point. What we want to do is to empower creative people to do what they love and make money and not feel gross about it, not to feel like they've sold their soul. And that's really important to us. Now, we all know how to make money. So the challenge is without losing your soul. And mm -hmm. I think we kind of butt up where the business part and the creativity overlap. That intersection is our sweet spot. For sure. That's awesome. So like, how do you operate in the rest of your life? Do you set these big, what'd you call them? Bags, big, hairy, audacious goals. Yes. Do you do this across every, every aspect of your life, every little corner? I set less ambitious goals for my personal life. Like, for example, if I want to be more physically fit, I'll say, like, here's the next milestone I have to get to. And because the problem is, if you have too many big, hairy, audacious goals, you'll start to feel overwhelmed. You'll feel like you're being pulled in 100 different directions. I'm a big believer in finding something that you want to excel at, pick one thing, and pull all your heart and energy towards that. What that means is you have to sacrifice other things that you want. So in order to, to be the teacher to as many people as I can, I have to give up some things. The easy things are I don't play video games anymore. I have a brand new PlayStation 4 that I've not even opened up yet with an amazing game. Like I bought it as a bundle like last Black Friday, which is almost a year ago. Haven't even opened it. 
I cut back on all my uh, television consumption. I start stop watching the news. I stop watching TV shows and TV series that can pull you in. I gave up a lot. I even gave up some of my exercise routine because I knew these are all things pulling me away from this goal. And I know this is a hard lifestyle to live, but sometimes if you want to achieve that thing that you want, I don't even want to call it greatness, but if you want to achieve that lofty goal, you have to give up something because we cannot manufacture more hours in the day. Damn, we could have just ended the episode right there because you just said all the things people need to hear, but a lot of things people don't want to take action on. Somebody, if you kind of want something, you're going to kind of get results. And I've been wanting to say that too many times. And being a side hustler with a day job, 168 hours in a week, 40 of them are already account, uh, allocated for. So like, what are you doing each day? And you say, focus on one thing at a time. And I try to break it down even more and be like, what's one thing I can do each day yeah. that, you know, essentialism and all those books that have really, really helped me say no to the things, the, the one thing, Gary Keller, exactly. That's, you know, once mm -hmm. I started being able to tap into that, that's what really helped me get to the next level. And I'm trying to figure out what's there, what's next. But since you're casting these big visions, is there ever a point where you have your internal critic or an external hater kind of convince you for even for a split second that your ambitious targets are, are dumb and are impossible? Do you ever deal with that? Are you a human being like the rest of us? I'm mostly cyborg, <laughs> made of circuitries and microprocessor. I, I I try to hold a kind of mindset, a belief system that I'm not going to attack myself internally, which helps me to be a little bit tougher externally. And so most definitely there are people who question what it is we do, our motives. They question the fact that we're leaving one industry to get into another, uh, calling us snake oil salesmen, get rich quick schemes, or dropping platitudes that are empty, that are easily attainable for $5 on the internet versus the courses that we, we charge money for. Mm -hmm. I get that. And, and here's the thing. That's how you know you're doing something right. Because if you do something that everybody loves, chances are you you did what was working 10 years ago and people have oftentimes doubt about new things, things that are going to challenge people. And if you're going to be a disruptive voice or a service in the, in the world, that means that you're going to disrupt and displace somebody. So that's the first people to get mad at you. So when you and I are talking about our displeasure with private art school or private school education, the rising costs, not necessarily meeting up with reality. There's a long line of people who are upset, but there's also a long line of people who are currently profiting from that business structure. And it's become the business of education. And I think something went wrong, just like healthcare, education. I think in, in a first world country, a beautiful one, the one that we live in, you would think that citizens of this country could at least have decent education and health care. Something is wrong here. It's become profit care. It's also become the business of education. I think it's broken or actually it's actually very efficient. It's just, it's just outdated. Yeah. I, I feel you. And then uh, James Victoria was on not too long ago and he calls it, don't be oatmeal. He's like, have a damn opinion. And I like that. So you intentionally go out there, not necessarily to disrupt, but to have a strong opinion knowing that it's going to serve the right people and it's going to get the wrong people off the bus. So you're, so you're able to easily block the noise because your mindset, you've built an inner fortress. Yes. And I think we all need to. We all need to love ourselves a little bit more, to cut ourselves slack when things don't work out, to forgive ourselves when we fail so that we are encouraged to try those things that don't work. Almost everybody you know, every creative human being, even non-creative people, when you ask them to do something that sends them out of the comfort zone, the first thing they think about is this what if. What if I fail? What if I don't succeed? What if people laugh at me? What if people ridicule me? What happens then? So we automatically go to the dark place, and that usually is enough to prevent us from doing the one thing that we need to do. So if we're kinder to ourselves, if we love ourselves a little bit more, if we're a little bit more forgiving of ourselves when we mess up, chances are we'll be less afraid to take those chances. So my business coach used to tell me this thing. He would say that, Chris, there are two types of people in the world, the people that run towards change and people who run away from change. Which one are you? Damn. So like fear, I've learned fear was always the thing that held me back from chasing what I want. And there's so many regrets I've had for the first until I used fear as like the, the indicator, the intuition nudging me to where I want to become, you know, pulling me 
fear like filled me with so many regrets easily probably for the first 25 years of my life and now when i find something that i'm personally scared of like asking chris doe to be on the podcast which is something ridiculous you know it ends up being like the thing that i was supposed to do to help me unlock that next little level so what are you afraid of i'm afraid of slow progress i'm afraid that a year from now i look back and i see that we're almost the same in the same place that we've been that scares me the most now luckily i run really fast not not in real life i'm just talking about <laughs> how quickly i adapt to change because you know you find me on the street you're like that guy does not run that fast yeah, i'm talking about metaphorically right, right? Uh, metaphorically speaking i run fast i adapt i change i fail i mess up all the time but i don't even code it in my mind as a failure because i don't want to dwell in the negativity Failure to me is just tuition you pay for success. So let's make an investment. Let's just make sure we don't keep paying that same tuition. For example, if you were upset with your education that didn't get you where you want to be, you want to go to the same school. You don't want to get a master's or a PhD in that same school. What you want to do is you pay the tuition, you recognize it for what it is, which is a learning opportunity. You thank it for what it was, which was in your case to help you to wake up to the reality because you were sold the bill of goods that just didn't work out. So you thank it for the experience and then you move on. That's the part that we need to learn to thank it and move on. What's one of those experiences that you had to thank recently, maybe oh my the gosh. last year, the last five years? Like what are an example oh, of two? Just so people know that yeah. you're not just the cyborg. Yeah, there are many things that I failed at. Uh, there are management decisions that I, I fail at. Uh, I, I, and this is going to sound a little bit cold, even though I'm trying to be human here, which is, I too fall into the trap where you become attached to somebody, somebody that works for you, that you you build a personal connection to, but they're they're really bad energy. They're not pulling their weight, and they become a negative drain on the people around them. And sometimes that gets the better of me, and I just hold on to people for too long, thinking today's the day they're going to turn the corner. Today's the day that they see the light, and they're just going to flip that switch and become the person I thought they were going to be. Like I invested too much in that potential. And I let that relationship drag on for too long. So eventually I had to say, you know what? I really like you. I like hanging out with you. It's just this is not a good fit for you. So you'll do well, but just not here. So those are mistakes that we make. And these are anybody that's in a management position that has people working for them. They're going to run into the situation as well. Yeah. in trimming the fat too late in a sense from a sometimes. Business. Yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately. I I find that with relationships too, being around negative, toxic energy mm. drains the room. When I'm an uppity guy, so I like to stay up because yeah. that helps me. It's, it's harder to get back up when you've been knocked down, but it's easier to stay up with, you know, keeping the glass full. But I mean, do you do the same kind of thing with just your personal relationships? Because I know me, I've had to cut a lot of toxicity out of my life to cut down on the external non-believers. Yeah, let me just say this to everybody that's listening to this or watching this on a video is that all your life, entire society, your neighborhood, your your childhood friends, even the people who love you, your parents, your, your siblings, they have a finite view of the world and what it is that you want in your heart. They want to protect you from making mistakes. They want to protect you from pain and suffering. So they always tend to advise you towards the safest path. And sometimes you just have to be able to block that out and stop that because you know what it is that you want. You know the risks that you're willing to take and what you're going to suffer and what you're going to give up. And if you're at that clear state of mind, you have to block that stuff out. Now, I don't want to label them as negative or toxic energy, but there are very few people in this world that's going to know what you want the way that you want it. So if you can find others, a community of three people, of 50 people, of 500 people, try to surround yourself with them. They're positive. They want to move forward. They're optimistic. They're of that mindset like anything can be done. And when you're around them, you start to to quiet those other voices, the doubting voices, the nagging voices that say, I can't do this, or who are you to say that you can try this thing? What audacity that you might have to do that? Well, if you align yourself around positive, optimistic people who are moving forward in their life, who who run towards change, that's who you want to be around. I love it because I preach the power of communities, whether, whether it's at yes. a conference like Creative South, I missed it this last year, or like I have a private Facebook community as well because I 
didn't I felt so isolated and it was surrounded in an area where everybody just likes to thrive in a dark hole and I had to leave Iowa to go find my people. So mm -hmm. that that's I guess been super important for me. Um, and you talk about doing the one thing earlier and knowing what you want. I feel like a lot of people have that fog. They don't know what they want, so they never gain traction or spin their wheels. Yeah. What kind of advice I, would you give to someone who struggling seeing through the fog? Okay. The first thing I was going to say is it's perfectly normal to be in the fog. A lot of us are in the fog and there is no timetable to say like by 18, you got to figure it out by 14 or 44. We all emerge out of the fog at some point in our life. And if you can get out of it sooner, great. That means you have more opportunity of life to be able to do what it is that you want. But I share stories about people who start their career at 83. Grandma Moses started her career and became a world famous painter at 83, something like that in her 80s. Right. So there's, it's never too late. But if you're in the fog right now to realize first, have the presence of mind to say like, gosh, I need to get some clarity about what it is I want. And if you could do it on your own, I would encourage you to do that. But most of us can't. We need a coach. We need to go to a workshop. We need to be around people who have some kind of framework to help guide us through this process. If none of that is available, I'm sure some kind of therapist is available or some kind of coach that you can find or community you can join. And lean on those people so here's what i would say if you think back to like when you were seven years old probably between seven and 12 like when life was really sweet like you knew enough to be alive but you weren't afraid of the world ask yourself what did you really enjoy doing what did you do when nobody was looking and that just filled you with joy and i would describe it as this sense of like what people would describe as butterflies in your stomach like if you were going to receive a package in the mail i think people still get packages in the mail but and you're like, I think it's coming on Tuesday. And every day you kind of, when you hear the, the, the mailman come by and you hear his truck pull up, you're like, oh, today's the day. That feeling of excitement, that nervous energy that you have, that's the feeling I have when I'm doing something that I truly love. I just can't wait. Like when my eyes open in the morning, I get that jolt of energy like, oh, I'm ready to go right now. And if you can listen to that part of your heart, it's not going to steer you wrong. So think back between seven and probably 12 years old, examine your life. Just sit there for a minute and travel back in time. Now, some people don't have a great memory. They're like, oh, I don't remember what I did. So here's a tip for you. Remember the house that you were in. Remember what bedroom your bedroom looked like. Remember the important memories that pop up. Was it around a birthday? Was it around camp? Was it around an activity that you did with mom or dad? Was there something there? Tap into that. You got me reminiscing right now. Hopefully, that's what everybody's doing, thinking right. back to the house. Right. A, a home holds a lot of memories. And if you travel back, one memory will trigger another memory. And so you just need a little help in identifying what that was. And I take it you're a big person. Like, you're a logical dude. But at the same time, I feel maybe you're kind of like me where – Logic tries to keep you safe again, like the people who love you, but it's more heart, intuition, and gut. Kind of that, that fear again, you know, plays into the, the more feeling intuitive side. Would you say you're more an intuitive kind of person and then you have logic that backs up? You know, I, I'm, I'm still trying to figure this out. If you had asked me this question a couple of years ago, I would tell you I'm 100% logical. But as I do more reading, I start to understand that all of us make decisions based on gut instinct and emotion. It's mm -hmm. part of that limbic brain and yeah. learning how to communicate with your limbic brain, which doesn't have words to describe what it's feeling and thinking. Learning how to talk to that part and understanding the signals and interpreting them correctly actually help you out in life. You'll notice sometimes if you're married, if you're in a partnership relationship or something and somebody says something to you and you're like, yeah, I get it. And they're like, no, you don't understand what I'm saying. And the reason why is because their limbic brain, the, the, the gut, the emotion, the intuition, as it signals the, what is it, the neocortex and it translates mm -hmm. into words, there's a misfire, a misconnect. I feel this, but the words I say is something else. And so when they say that word and you're like, I get that word, they're like, no, no, you don't understand what I'm saying. What that's really saying to you right then and there is they have some emotional energy that they can't properly articulate to you and you're just listening to the words. 
And what we understand is there's very little of what we communicate is in the words that we choose. I think it's only like 18%. The rest of it is in the tone, the body language, which is probably the biggest driver. So you got to put all that stuff together. So for, for me, the logic is just trying to understand the emotion. And maybe what I thought as being mostly logical is just an ability to relay the emotion to the logic part and to be able to talk to each other. So when did you start making this transformation? Was it books? Was it something you heard in a podcast? Or you know, if other people who are logical, but then they find themselves playing it safe and riding the fence. I mean, I can preach it. You can preach it. But like, where did you learn it? Mine's been books and podcasts and mm -hmm. connecting with other people who open up and share. Yeah. I'm like, okay, that makes sense. You're kind of articulating what I have a hard time putting into words, how I can pick up a vibe mm -hmm. in the room when I walk in. But I'm not like mm -hmm. a data technical kind of person. Yeah. So I'm not sure that I 100% agree with this idea that if you're logical, you're going to be more conservative. I think to me, logic is just I understand the risk and I'm okay with the risk, right? So that's that's where you have the courage. So here's a philosophical debate for you, which is, is it courageous for you to do something that you're not aware of, that you're afraid of? See, I think you have to recognize that you're afraid of doing something that you're going to lose, that you might lose it all, and to act despite that. See, like ignorant people, dumb people who 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 run into the jungle unaware that there's dangerous creatures out there, they're not actually courageous at all. They're not brave. They're just ignorant, right? But somebody who's like, there are lions out there, there are poisonous snakes, and there are all kinds of other creatures, but I got to go save my friend. They're three miles in. If I don't take action today, they're for sure going to be dead. So you run into it despite knowing that. The logic part, the part to get to your question is, I think I've uh, I've had a strange upbringing in that I'm a latchkey kid. Uh, we came to America um, after fleeing communist, communism in Vietnam, came to America, and my parents did everything they could to kind of lift us out of lower economic income, right, the lower economic class. And so they weren't around a lot. That meant I had a lot of free time. And I think when I was growing up, I had a problem with this. I felt lonely. I felt abandoned. I felt I, I didn't have a sense of who I was. So there was a lot of self-doubt, um, insecurity. But later on in life, I started to realize something. I, I hardly ever struggle with internal voices that are fighting me for what it is that I believe because none was put in there because my parents were not around that much. My older brother, being four years older than me, wasn't really around to like, hey, dope, do this, don't do that, right? So it was kind of just by myself for a long period of time. Plus, my parents' parenting style is very laissez-faire, just let live. There's some parameters we want to warn you about in life. Other than that, you figure it out. So I was kind of left to my own devices, and I think that's been the strongest platform for me to figure out who I am. Then when coaches came into my life much later or books, it was pretty empty. The canvas was empty. It wasn't filled with stuff. Uh, I'm reading this book. Um, it's called um, The Surprising Thing About How We Learn. And there's a concept in there. Now, I'm, I'm just about a fifth of the way through the book. So bear in mind, this could all make no sense whatsoever. But there's a concept in there. And he describes it as forget to learn. It's a very powerful concept because... We generally associate forgetting with absent-mindedness, with carelessness, with, that's generally bad. But his whole study has revealed that in order for us to learn new things, we have to forget the old things. We selectively choose what was important to us, like maybe design theories, typography, design history, and we forget like what we learned in chemistry or physics because it's not something we apply every single day. So having not a lot of stuff in my brain allowed me to more easily and to adapt to the new information. I didn't have a lot to forget. It was already empty to begin with. And so at a young age, you were able to build that inner fortress real quick and then put yourself in a position to be coachable. Yes. And young age being relative here, because for from from basically birth to I think about 18 years old, I doubted every minute of everything that I did super self-conscious, super okay. introverted, and I started to find my path. But when I started to find my path, there wasn't a lot of baggage in there. That makes sense. 
Um, I don't me. want people to think, oh my God, he got it worked out like four. I'm like, you know, when it did wasn't you like come, that. When did you guys come here? No, no. That you were like, <laughs> you were a boss and just no. a little G from like, you know, <laughs> like five years old. <laughs> Not at all. No, it was like, oh was my like, God, I just wow. want to be like everybody else. What did I no, do no. wrong in my life? Why did my parents <laughs> screw me up? No, okay. <laughs> that makes me feel. Oh, better, I share right? that. Yeah, I share that in case some of your audience are, are parents of young children, that all this kind of nurturing and kind of helicopter parenting may actually be doing more harm to your child than you actually think. That's Let all. Them fail. Let them fail. Give them space. As long as they don't hurt other people or have uh, mortal injuries, I think you got to just let them do stuff. So what if they scrape their knees? So what if they break a limb? It'll be okay. They'll learn. Being that my son will be turning 15 months by the time this comes, 16 months, uh, that's timely for me as this little dude, this little turkey is just all over the place. Yeah. So I'm trying not to be a mama bird, a papa bird, and just squawking yeah. all over it. But um, just to pivot to something that I know is a huge pain point for a lot of listeners and a lot of people in the creative field when it comes to the importance of niching down or niching. Do you say mm -hmm. niche or niche? I say both. Whatever rhymes better for what I'm saying. Perfect. Okay. I like that. I like that. I'm in the Midwest is niche, but everywhere else, everyone I talk to, it's niche. And I'm like, I'm too yeah. Midwest <laughs> for that. I'm too Iowan. So, uh, oh, it does sound yeah. a little bit more sophisticated to say niche it versus it sounds niche. Like more like coastal, just... like New York, LA. Oh, it's so niche. Eating quiche, something <laughs> like that, you know, niche and quiche, fancy stuff. So, uh, yes. regardless tangents. Um, but a lot of people are, find it's hard to niche down niche down because they're afraid yeah. to feel pigeonholed in one direction when they love yes. lots of things they love doing all the things and this was me this really spoke to me aside from like mm -hmm. this year I, I you know tom ross right like tom ross has kind of been yes. been a big help design cuts? yeah yeah embracing embracing just going in one lane picking my path and just like staying in my lane and owning it embracing it and that's mm -hmm. i've had more growth this year than I've ever had because I stopped spreading myself too thin, but you're in, you're making ways in the creation of educational content and resources to help yeah. creatives make money space. Uh, how valuable has it been for you to niche down and go this lane and just block out anything else, have your team, your squad all aligned to that same vision and how you don't have, do you ever really get shiny object syndrome of like, Oh man, I could do that. But no, I'm so aligned with this right now. Like how important has it been for niching down for you? And then yes. can you speak to the benefit of it for someone out there, especially someone early in their side hustle or looking to make a pivot to do their thing full time, but they just haven't quite figured it out yet? Yes. So creativity is a double edged sword. It allows us to find connections between disparate ideas. Like we can look at a tree and look at a cloud and like, oh, that's kind of like this and just find the glue that brings them together. And you know that you're creative because a non-creative, in air quotes, will come by and like, how did you even come up with that? I can't see that. And you saw a face there. You saw a dog and you made these things. And to you, it's natural and it's beautiful and it's instinctual. But here's the other side to that thing. The thing that makes you strong, the ability to see other things and bring things together. It also means that that's interesting. That's interesting. I could use this at some point. And so we're, we're kind of very divergent in our thinking and, and we, we go shallow in a lot of different areas. That's one of the biggest problems because when it comes to proficiency, expertise, even mastery, it's, it takes a lot of practice of one thing, one discipline, one craft to become really, really good. We know good people when we see them. Let's take Bob Ross, for example, the famous painter who did his series on public television, right? That's, that's, like Happy I, Shiny Clouds. I didn't have cable right? growing up, so that was like all I watched was Bob PBS, Ross and right? Julia Child. That's all I had. Yes. Amazing. Okay, yeah. so we're, we're dating ourselves here. We're yeah, like, what the heck are they talking about? I'm an old about? man. <laughs> right? So he would go and paint, and you would sit there and just marvel like, wait a minute. That was a thing of paint, and now it's a tree. Now it's a mountain? Like, how do you even do that? Because happy he's had his 10,000 hours of practice carving out happy mountains, happy trees, and happy clouds, right? He did that effortlessly. And then we see ourselves and we're like, oh, God, I got to design a logo today. And it's like, oh, the grind. I'm going to have creative block and all these kinds of things. And tomorrow we have to design a website. And the same process goes over and over and over again. Now, do I suffer from shiny object syndrome? You betcha. If you're a creative person, you get drawn towards the new, the different, the novel, because the challenge is so alluring and repetition makes us feel really dull. But 
those things work against you in a profession, in a career, and in a business. It works against you in marketing yourself and becoming known for something, right? You can see these athletes with the very few exceptions, these multi-sport athletes generally fail in the sport that they're not dominant in. They think I'm an athlete and I shouldn't be limited to this thing. There are exceptions. However, the majority of people, if we're lucky enough to have one gift, focus in on that, find what it is that makes you happy, the world will reward you for it. Now, we're an education company and we were just talking about it earlier today. I was having a conversation with one of my leads, Matthew Encina, who heads up our content team. And he's like, Chris, there isn't a template for what it is that we're doing. And he said that with a little concern. I said, I know. And this is when I smile. It's because it's not been done before. And that's interesting to me. Because if everybody's doing something, we may be too late. So the, the human instinct is to find that template that somebody else has done. But that, that says that the market is saturated. So we're moving into a strange place. So yeah, there is no blueprint for what it is that we're doing because what we do, what we think we do is quite unique and we're in a unique time in history. The opportunities are there. So it's easy for us to get off course and I'll say one day, uh, let's do events and we'll just do it. And then later on they'll say, is that helping us with our goal? Right, so we have to kind of just make sure that there is room for some exploration outside the core discipline. Otherwise, we'll drive ourselves crazy and deny who we are. But the majority of our effort has to be focused on the one thing if we want to become really successful. So someone who's not in the education industry, like a lot of these freelancers or someone yes. just trying to find their style. One day they're trying to attract murals. One day they're trying to attract editorial pieces. The other time they're trying to sell merch. You know, how mm -hmm. would you speak to the value and the importance of niche? I, I, I totally believe there should be an exploratory phase in the beginning yes. when you're trying to find your style. But I still think curation is important to define the 100%. label that you want to portray yourself to the world because I didn't define my label and I made people guess. I didn't set expectations. And then I'm like, why do these people suck and not see how great my work is when it was pretty average too? But I, I kind of lost sight of the value of it, but like, what would you say to speak to someone who's kind of found their groove, they found what they want to do, yet they want to do a lot of things still, like murals or editorial or this, and their Instagram account is just littered with all these different things. What kind of advice would you give them? Like pick one thing for a season kind of stuff? Okay, there's a couple of ways to tackle this. And I, I butt heads with more people about this than anything where they're like, I don't want to focus on that one thing. I don't want to sacrifice all these things, right? So I, I want to hold on to that thought for a little bit. So for those people who are that adamant against it, just put those people aside. I'll address that in a little bit. The people who are on the fence who realize, man, I'm not making the traction that I want. I'm not being known for anything. Nobody's invited me to speak. And I'm kind of making the middle of the pack to, towards the lower end of what I think people get paid to do this. I want you to just ask yourself this one question to get super introspective. What accounts do you love? Like when I ask you who's a really great hand lettering artist, make a list and see how far down you can make that list. How many names can you write from memory? How many great identity designers are there? And make a list for that. And for every discipline that you think you love, just make a list. You, and you'll soon realize the list falls off pretty fast, right around seven. There, there's some studies behind this, right? That the human brain can remember about seven things. That's why the phone number is seven digits. That's why a lot of things are seven. Magic is okay? seven. The magic is seven. So around eight, nine, or 10, if you can even get that deep, like list your favorite like subgenre bands, it's going to be tough. Like list uh, 10 trap bands, list 10 whatever. And it's just like when you get into a narrow area, it becomes quite difficult. Okay, why did I ask you to do that? Because if you're the client, if you're the, the New Yorker magazine or the Wall Street Journal and you're looking for an illustrator or designer, they also remember seven people. And what have you done to become one of the seven? We also know this too. The market leader commands a third of the market. Or, or like the predominant part of the market and everybody else fights for position two, three. And if you're position four and five, you're pretty much doomed. Like Apple commands the market share for smartphones. They make the most amount of money in smartphones, right? And everybody else is just trying to get a piece of that, at least in America. I'm sure those stats are changing. But if you think about it, it's like you have to be position one, two or three 
if you have any chance of doing well. So when you look at your own work now, look through the lens of a buyer. And you see a little bit of everything. You see a little uh, image of the dog, the kid, um, packaging, lettering. And what, is, what kind of box are they going to put you in? Because they need to remember you for something. Yeah, Blake is really good at 55 things. But later on, when I'm looking for the one person, who do I call? I don't call Blake. I call Mary. And if you look at this logic from a marketing expertise point of view, you'll see that this is true almost everywhere you look at in the world. When you have chronic back pain, you go to a specialist. When you have, uh, you, and when, you, when you're nearsighted like myself and you need to get LASIK surgery, you don't go to the general physician to take care of that. You just don't. When we're in trouble, when it's life and death, when deadlines are upon us, when the outcome is really important, we look for the market leader in something. And usually, top of mind can hold about three people. So if you realize that then, what are you doing and how are you impacting how the market perceives you? This is the danger that people run into. Yeah. Okay, have, that makes have, sense, right? Yeah, for sure. I have one person in mind that this is like really challenging them right now because yeah. they're also creating work to attract a follower instead of creating work to attract a potential client. Okay, you just said something right there. When you put together your portfolio, and your portfolio has like a broad definition today because it used to be like what I put in a case and send it to somebody, but now your portfolios, your social media channels, it's your LinkedIn page, it's your Behance or Dribble page, it's your website, that's your portfolio these days. Don't put out work that you like. Put out the work you'd like to get, like what you wanna get hired for, and there's a big difference. I like lots of things. I don't wanna be hired for all those things. I wanna be hired for a couple of those things and that's it. So now let's address the people who are really entrenched in this position, like no, uh, Chris, you're wrong, you're so, so wrong. I say, okay, that's fine. So let's, let's just go with your plan. If being a lot of things to a lot of people and you believe in the Renaissance person, if you believe in the polymaths, do that. If that works for you, if you're getting hired and you're in demand and you're the, the, the first name on somebody's tongue when they think of something, go for it, right? Because people are really quick to point out, well, look at Da Vinci. I said, okay, yeah, Da Vinci was and is the definition of the Renaissance man. How many Da Vinci's have we encountered since then? Name 10. Especially in a noisy world with social media. I mean, I just dare you. I mean, there is a once in a generation, multi-generation person that is just so attuned to the natural world and the mind and creativity. They seem to be tapped into something else. And ask yourself, how many people are able to do that? How many people can sing, dance, paint, recite poetry and act? How many of those people could do that really well as compared to how many people are trying to do one of those things? That's the thing. So if you are one of those polymaths and you were given way more share of talent than the rest of us, hey man, bless you, you do your thing, you're gonna do really well. And if you want to hold that position because that's how you find comfort and self-definition, self-identity, who, who are we to try and stop you? That's totally fine. But if you are in that position, and you're not getting the work and nobody's calling you or, and you're getting the low rate and people are passing you up and you wonder why or the only clients you have are the ones within a 30 mile radius it's time to say like maybe there's a different way to do this i think you just triggered a lot of people right there listeners <laughs> For me, but then hear from someone like you who puts out content on this like all the time. Yeah, people are triggered, but I think nudged in a direction. So like, what are you going to do now? You know, the ball's in your court. Are you going to keep spinning your wheels and not getting any traction? Like I did for like my first four and a half years of me pursuing my side hustle, my side business, or are you going to pick a lane and go all out, even if it's just for a season, you know? You know, my season yeah. is all out in coaching and podcasting. No freelance, no merch, no nothing. And I've had more confidence working within these constraints than I've ever had before. And it allows me to connect with my end user 
way more deeper. You know, Seth Godin, you're a big Seth Godin fan too. Instead of casting a wide net, I get to go for depth right now, that minimal viable audience. And like that book really blew my mind and helped me kind of switch uh, my approach, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure you can align to that big time, but um, that's perfect. Yeah, 100%. Okay. Um, before we go into rapid fire mode, I, I did. We could go Joe okay. Rogan. I could oh, that wasn't rapid fire. Okay, no. I'm scared now. <laughs> <laughs> Man, we we could go Joe Rogan. Go for like three hours. Mm -hmm. I got a whole list of stuff I'm not going to be able to get to. So maybe a round two one day. But um, this show is yeah, round uh, two. This show is fuel for your mind and creative grind. All right, it's all about the inner winning the the inner war in your head as well as just showing up each day with intention, just crushing it. But you got to have these sources of fuel. I believe there's an internal sources and external sources. So for you, what are either your internal or your external forces that fuel your grind? Why do you get up each day to do what you do? What's your why? That's super clear, and we already touched on it. The ability to make content, to impact the lives of people, to empower them, to make money doing what they love is really what gets me out of bed every single day. And like you, I create content. And then I get to hear if that content has helped people and I get to hear it from all platforms and all channels. I'm just screen capturing as much of it as possible because you know, that's the fuel. That's like rocket fuel. Because when you live for a purpose higher than yourself, whether that be about religion and your family, helping your local community or the international community, man, when that power is behind you, you, you are like a rocket ship pull, pulling 100 tons and you don't even feel it. You can just go, go, go. And my wife is always startled. Like when I get up in the morning, my eyes are open. She's like, what's going on? You have a meeting? I'm like, no, I don't have a meeting. You have a call? I said, no, but I have a calling. Calling, yes. All right. right. And then she rolls her eyes and goes back to bed. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> she's full of herself again. Dad yeah, joke, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I have a calling and my calling is to, to do as much good as I can before I'm six feet under. And I know I'm living on borrowed time. We all are. And I act with that urgency. Damn, you articulated, I think, even the next layer of the onion I'm trying to peel back daily as I push this, you know, like with my son in the picture, that's that's a fuel source. But how you said it, that's a uh, that's deep create for something bigger than yourself. That's always kind of been behind the scenes why I've done coaching when I blew my back out playing college football. It was in coaching and then I couldn't get a job anywhere for three years. And it was personal training, whatever I could do to like try and help other some, someone else get a a little glimpse of their potential. And I feel like you just summarized it, man. You're good with action Thank you. steps. You're good with action steps. Let me make steps. this, <laughs> let me make this super grounded for you. Cause I can imagine somebody who, who may be earlier in their career listening to this, like, oh yeah, these old geezers talking about their purpose and something bigger than you. I'm gonna make it real tangible for you right now. Let me ask you this question, Scotty. Do you like to sell yourself? Do you like sales? Do you enjoy doing that? I feel like I'm selling and performing for everyone every second, every minute of every day. And mm -hmm. I've learned to love it when I have that fuel or I know what I want. Or even for the day job, if I'm selling a wireframe or I'm selling this logo concept, I know what they want to hear, but I'm selling it to them in a way that I know is solving their issue and providing value to their end user, you know, something like that. So like I enjoy sales. I don't think I used to. Yeah, but you've learned to to like it, or even I've learned to love, love it. it. I like the chase or it. live with it. <laughs> yeah, like I, I yeah. can handle being told no now, but like right. I, I enjoy I enjoy the selling part of things. I did. Have you ever been in? Have you ever been in a room? Because uh, it's a little different for you than it is for me because I don't have a day job to go to. But let's say you're you're traveling uh, with your family, right? And you go somewhere where you think this proprietor could use some help with whatever it is that you do. Like let's say you do marketing or design. And you're like, God, I just, it just feels inappropriate for me to come and, you know, I don't have my sales hat on. I'm not even, I'm on vacation right now. And do you ever feel, have you ever found yourself in a situation where you thought maybe you could broach a subject, but it just didn't feel appropriate and you feel kind of weird about it and just not do something? Yeah, I feel that was more in the past now. Okay. I'm, I'm more, if the answer is always no, if you never ask kind of person. Yes. Okay. Uh, but then you've made that transition where most creative people I know have a really hard time selling themselves for themselves. In a company structure, it's very different because there's more people who count on you. 
So here's a little story I want to relate to you. Okay. I'm in New York city. I'm, I'm hanging out with my friends from the, my, my coaching group. And I have a strange idea. I want to go to Saks Fifth Avenue in Times Square. And I want to get some boxes because I have a presentation idea. I don't want to buy anything at Saks Fifth. I just want their boxes. I have this kind of concept of like the Russian dolls and I want to get some boxes. And we were just running around the around Brooklyn all day. So we don't look that presentable. And you step into Saks Fifth Avenue, especially at this location, and you feel as much a fish out of water as you can. Everybody in there is wearing suits and ties to go shopping. It's crazy. And you just oh. see like that old money walking around. And we we come up to some people and we ask the 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 person up front, hey, can we get some boxes? Like, no, talk to the concierge. I'm like, okay. Long story short, we look at each other. And these two guys, Chris and Mo, they say back to me, let's split up team. Let's all see if we can go get some boxes for Chris's presentation tomorrow. Let's meet back here and let's see what happens. We all split. We all come back. And each one of us has a different story. But we were all victorious. And we're, we're leaving Saks Fifth, not having spent a dime, all of us with bags and boxes with nothing in them. And we're all just giddy like children. And we're sharing stories. And Mo says to me, you know, Chris, I have to say this to you, man. It was so much easier for me to go and sell, to ask for something that I would normally feel really awkward about. How come I can't do that for myself? And we stopped in our tracks as we were walking. I said, Mo, it's because you're doing it for somebody other than yourself. That's the big difference. He goes, right. So when you sell, you're doing it for yourself. See, there is no other purpose. But I said, you have a business partner, that guy right there, Chris. He has ambitions, he has goals, he has rent to pay, he has car payments, insurance, he's got things he has to do. So could you not sell for him? Aren't you guys like best friends? See, so when we remove the lens from ourselves, like what's in it for me, and we transfer it over to somebody else, it becomes much easier to sell. And he's looking at me, he reaches out his hand in front of me, he's trembling a little bit, he's like, dude, I have goosebumps right now. You just help me to realize What's at stake if I don't go out and do what I need to do? So all of us, I think, could use a little bit of that. So instead of focusing on ourselves, if we focus on somebody else, like if you have a parent that you need to take care of or your wife or that little little man that you talked about, uh, maybe he can't recognize it today, but you're trying to set the template for what it means to be a father, to be a person who's focused on his dream. And though... Maybe the dialogue isn't rich. He's watching and he's learning. And if you channel that inside of you, that when you're in that shop and you're like afraid to ask that person, just think, what is my little man going to think of me right now? And do it for him. And you will be powered in ways that you've never been powered before. Like you will have this kind of energy and you'll be lifted up and supported in this way. And this kind of mindset shift, it's mostly internal, right? You're just thinking about things differently. And it allows you to approach the problem in totally different ways. It's removing your ego and transferring something much higher, much nobler. And I know this works in many facets. Like my younger brother and I would fight all the time. But when we went out into the street and somebody picked on one of us, the differences dropped and then we would attack back. Like I would normally fight him, my younger brother, but if somebody's going to make fun of him, I don't know what it is. Something rises in me and says, we're family, man. And it's you versus us. And now I have to defend him, even though I'm going to get my butt kicked too. We're going to go for it. So this is how that whole living for more than just yourself, having a higher purpose can help you in a bigger, broader, like this is my life dream. Or in very small day-to-day -day actions, you can use that to fuel yourself. That was uh, the most eloquent answer to this question yet. Switching that lens of, <laughs> for me, through a lens of service, in a sense, or a lens of legacy, in a sense, too, for me as well. Yeah, that's dope. So, again, this show is, uh, it's bigger than just design and branding. I like to get that stuff out of people and, you know, if I can get them for pricing, whatever. But uh, this is more the mental side of what being a creative is about with this show and that, oh, crap, I can't hear you. No, I'm sorry. Don't worry. I was telling oh. my wife I'm recording. Oh, okay. Okay. Keep well, on, keep on. Again, that's why it's the perspective podcast It's for things like that, that can you give that paradigm shift in things. So 
uh thanks for actually like giving a legit answer outside of the realms of design um let's hit rapid fire so i can respect the rest of your time today so you can get back to okay okay before we do that you yeah. said a word that's really powerful and i want to highlight it a little bit i want to put it under a magnifying glass okay you said how can you be of service to other people and we think about this when people from the military come back they talk to each other when did you serve when did you serve they serve their country they serve an idea much bigger than them and people are literally willing to lay down their lives for a purpose bigger than themselves right so when firefighters rush into a building they are serving something much greater than themselves and if you can tap into some of that power that magic whew, what couldn't you do okay rapid fire time let's go no see this i could go deep on this shit for like <laughs> hours and hours and hours dude this is the stuff that lights me up so i know people mm. are going to be lit off this too so uh rapid fire let's like let's ease the uh let's let's add a little bit of comic relief in here so okay all right let's do it if you were on death row, i'll try my best i'll try my best <laughs> if you were on death row super serious what would your last yeah. slice of pizza be probably hawaiian anywhere specific oh my la no nowhere i'm not i'm not a pizza snob all right oh i i'm, I'm a pizza snob not really i let yeah. people enjoy things but man do people give you a hard time for having pineapple in your pizza yeah i know yes they do that's, that's okay so i don't really care let it, yeah, I don't even let, care. Let people enjoy things. All right. Early bird or night owl? I think I know this already. I'm burning, unfortunately, the, the candle at both ends right now. I'm up early and I'm up late. But usually I'm a night owl. But is that for a season because of a big launch or a course? No. You know, it used to be that, oh, I'm an artist. We'll, we'll all come into the office around 10-ish. We'll get serious work done by 2 p.m. And then we'll just grind the rest of the time. And now it's like, I can't sleep anymore. It's really weird. Like when the sun comes up, I open my eyes, I start thinking about things and I want to write, I want to read, I have things to do and people to help. And I just get going. And basically I run until I'm tired. And then when I'm tired, I'm like, I'm not functioning well. I'm just going to go to sleep. Most of the times that's around one o'clock in the morning, sometimes two or three. That's how I roll now. Wow, man. So do you do your more willpower tasks in the morning? in terms of like writing because like i i need writing when i have the most willpower it's hard for me to do that in the middle or the end of the day when i have world's distractions you know weighing me down you know i find that uh, in the last six months I, i'm doing something very different than i have the first 20 plus years of my life i mean my my career <laughs> excuse me the thing that i'm doing now is i just don't force it anymore I don't try to write when I don't feel inspired to, and I don't try to like edit or organize when I don't feel to feel like it. So when I'm not feeling super creative, I just organize my files or I'll, I'll clean up this office, which is a mess, you know, I'll, I'll do that. And when I feel like I'm writing, like I'm inspired to write, I try my best to write at that moment because I got to capture it. So I know some people work better at like, this is my schedule. This is what I'm going to do. And you kind of force it out. Usually when I do that, it's a turd. I'm in the business of polishing turds, dude. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> see, and during that season, having a day job, yeah. I have to like be intentional, sure. but I strive in the next year or two when I plow through this private student loan debt to be more act on the muse. So that's encouraging to know there's another side through this brick wall of turds. So, um, I gotta, I gotta ask you a question. What's up? How, how long has it been since you got out of school? when did you graduate? I graduated in 2010. So, Okay, not that long ago. Yeah. Okay. And so that's like we're nine years out, right? Mm -hmm. And how much money do you have left on that student loan? Man, um, I was financially illiterate really until this last year. So in this year alone, I graduated with like 75K. And this year alone, I've been able to tackle. I had like 15,000 left on just my own student loan. Good this job. Year. Yeah. You got real smart this year, huh? Basically, I started taking myself yeah. a lot more serious once my son was born. That like really changed, radically you changed pay down that debt. everything. I'm trying to like change my family tree right now. Nobody went to school, nobody went played sports, nobody wow. did anything with their dreams. So it's like I'm trying mm -hmm. to pave a new way for my little man. But nice, yeah. So by end of next year, 2020, overall, I, I like talking about casting that big vision out loud and letting it be known and spreading it. That's why I asked you that earlier. Because it's contagious and you start manifesting and attracting it. Yes. So by the end of 2020, next year, December 31st, 2020, we will have paid off about $90,000. I have it written down everywhere 
all consumer debt is adios. And then I could start paving the way for my wife to be home part time. And then I'll be able to make my switch paving that way. You just posted a dope ass carousel earlier about um, uh, planning your escape. And that really, really hit home with me. I feel like, man, I've already been checking (laughs) some of these boxes. So this let me know I'm going in the right path right now. But yeah. Thank you for Isn't that. Isn't it wonderful able to talk about that out loud? It feels empowering. Oh, it doesn't it? So like you have a clear goal, you have a timeline. So the smart goals are yeah, like in full goals, effect. That's what right? corporate life taught me. Smart goals. Yes. Yes. So you're gaining clarity through articulation by saying your goal, by writing it down, by making yeah. it sit in front of you. You can't ignore it anymore. And so when you want to go out and buy a, like a new car because you think you want it, you're like, no, 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 no. Keep we got a goal. Back. Stick to the goal. When you're done with that, you can do whatever you want. So when you want to buy a new piece of kit or whatever it is, you're like, Ugh, is this helping me with my goal or is this hurting me? Yeah. And if you make the right smart decision, you're going to crush that goal. And it's just so it feels so good. It's I don't know what else there is. Like the best way to be your own boss is set up goals and hit those goals and reward yourself. So you set your own oh, goals yes. and you crush them. Man, I get like that productivity high. If I could show up and crush that one big thing a day, that's helping yeah. me continue to just take one step closer to that 2020 goal of paying this off or having my big goal with my business of being a top 10 design arts podcast by the end of 2020 as well. You know, like that's, that's the driving stuff. But again, so many people struggle knowing what they want, but when you know what you want, you set up these little filters and it's easier to block out the internal, the external critic as much or build that fortress. So, Mm -hmm. but it's been a big shift for me just within the last year, having that, that life change and be like, wow, Everything I do now affects this little turd and I need to just grow the hell up right, you know, right. I, I, and take myself <laughs> more seriously and listen to people like Tom Ross who want to help or really embrace the content you put out there. People that are challenging me, you know, to niche down, to focus yeah. on service, like serving, serving instead of chasing the glory, which I used to do. The, oh, can I get a feature here today? Uh, can I get more likes on this? But when I made that, that internal switch or the flip, flip that switch of instead of chasing the glory what if i chase the impact and that's where the show pivoted and i find out a lot of the things of chasing the glory become a byproduct when you chase the impact you know the money and the opportunities they come your way when you're on this different frequency you open up and you let it flow to you because you're focused on that higher thing you're focused on helping someone else get on a pedestal of unlock their breakthroughs you know and then you find that the the opportunities come your way. At least I've, that's how I found it. Maybe that's true for you too. Once it became mm-hmm. bigger than you. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just been a big shift in me. Once I hit 30 and my son was born, like something changed in me. And now I want to like help other people tap into that change and get through those obstacles way quicker than it took me. You know? Mm-hmm. Wow. So much for rapid fire, right? <laughs> 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 oh, we'll, we'll keep it rolling, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you could have lunch with one person dead or alive, who would it be and why? It'd probably be with Steve Jobs. Or I mean, my, I don't want to pick his brain. I want to understand what makes that guy tick. Mine would be Bob Ross and Stephen King. So Beautiful. Sure, but yeah. Stephen King's still alive, though. Yeah, but it's, I, I prefaced it dead or alive. Steve yeah. Jobs, that's yeah, it's a good true. one, too. Or Godin, man. Seth Godin, for sure. All right. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, you can uh, still make some of those work. Um, Godin's up there on the high list, too, to ask, yes. too. I saw yours with him. But... um. Why is Key not so powerful for carousels? Flexibility, speed, and it makes you focus on the big picture. Use the right tool for the right job. This is about presentations. It's not about micro kerning. That's not important in, in presentations. Dope. Okay, that was the most rapid. All right, if you were a typeface or a font, what style would you be and what would you be called? I would be most definitely a sans serif and most definitely I would be called Helvetica. That would be your name. If you could choose any name of your own typeface or font that you were created, you created it and you're naming it. Okay. It'd be called ultimate flexibility bold. That variable typeface go from right here to that super narrow to fit on that package all the way yeah. to some fat, chunky, sans serif. Okay. Sure. Word. Um, what do you do for fun when you unplug and recharge? Like, what do you do? I know you travel, but a lot of time it travels for work. You know, sometimes I get into f- funky moods. Like, actually, writing and reading is actually very pleasurable for me now, now that I have a purpose behind why I read. So, I would say, and a guilty indulgence is reading a piece of like trash literature. 
So not not like a serious business book, but just not like a, a porn magazine. magazine. Okay. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> I know the writing is amazing in Playboy and no. all. Uh, like just <laughs> reading a graphic novel or a, a dumb design book, which is like, oh, that's really cool looking. All right, final question, and then we'll do a quick little recap. But uh, where can people go to follow and support you online as well as invest in your educational resources, especially like the Instagram mastery course and everything like that? Mm -hmm. People can find this everywhere. I'm at the Chris Doe, that's D-O, on Instagram, on Twitter. You can find us also on YouTube at youtube.com slash the future. The future is not spelt with an E. Drop the ego. So the future is here. You can find us everywhere. And we do depend on our sustaining members, the contributing members who help us to make the dream come true. We look at it like this. Some of us have, some of us have not. So the haves can just buy our products and get tools and resources to help them. They're going to support the have not. PC family, I'm very sorry about that abrupt ending. I had no idea that was gonna happen. Chris and I had so many technical difficulties in terms of our microphones, Wi-Fi connection, Skype being a turd, et cetera, but the content was hot. There's a ton of gold baked in here, so you know it is what it is. You can't be perfect all the time, and I'm just showing up just trying to kick out the highest quality content that I possibly can and deal with um, the whole quality of audio and video side as we go and I learn, but Chris, if you're watching this, thank you so much for being a part of this episode and this milestone today with 150. If you want to connect with him, I have every single link of his down in the YouTube description. And thank you for being along for the ride and just riding and vibing out with me. 150 episodes. This is super special. And as you can see around me right now, this isn't my normal setup as I'm moving in Wednesday. So two days from now, I'm gonna be moving into my new home, which means a bigger and better studio, a permanent setup, new microphone, new equipment, better quality, everything. It's all improving. So again, thank you for supporting me as I continue to build and figure out how to improve and provide you more value. So thank you so much. Finish off the year strong. Thanks for celebrating 150 with me. Much love to you. Peace. Thanks again for listening. It'd be awesome if you took the time to subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, and let the comment below so we can connect. Again, if you want to catch a shout out as a future listener of the week, make sure you subscribe to the show on iTunes and give it a rating and review.